All right, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers at a very special time because we have a guest with us who is uh, hailing from Germany and uh, he's six hours ahead, six, I think so. Um, but Andrea and I are here to have a conversation with Daniel about an article that we were just beginning to talk about how old it is. Um, it was published six months ago, which in chat GPT time is like, ancient right <laughs> chat gpt right yeah All right so let me not babble more and um just just say i'm paul allison from new york city work at the new york city writing project and the national writing project and i did some introduction before for daniel but, so i won't do more but andrea do you want to introduce yourself yeah my name is andrea zoller and i'm here in uh oakland county michigan which if you're looking at the hand, it's like right here. This is the state of Michigan. I live right here. Daniel, I don't and know if you know, that's what all Michigan people do. All yeah. Michigan people, we gotta oh, put up our hand see. and we that's stay where we live. There's some, there's some hand mark. I don't know. Yeah, because the, the state looks like a hand. And oh, uh, I am very interested in AI possibilities and I've been following what Paul's been doing on Youth Voices very closely, so I'm excited to be part of this conversation. Cool, cool. So Dan, you introduce yourself a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm Great. Daniel Boschek. I'm recently appointed professor at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. Um, name of the chair is Mobile Intelligent User Interfaces. Um, I previously was at LMU Munich in Germany and also did some research visits at the University of Glasgow and the Aalto University in Finland. Um, my main background is human computer interaction, and um, I combine that with machine learning, AI. Also, generally interested in interdisciplinary research, so work with people from psychology uh, and physics, for instance. And yeah, the current focus of my, my lab here is on interaction with generative systems. Uh, we've also looked a little bit into images, but mainly with text. Um, and yeah, that's also where this, this line of work, where the article is from that you um, mentioned. Um, yeah. Right. Cool. And, um, <clears throat> could, just sort of foundationally, can you break down yeah. some of those words like human, I, when you use HCI in your article, I was very yeah. familiar with Linda flower, <laughs> okay, but I then see. you said yeah. HCI and I'm like, wait a second, I got to look that one up. Anyway. But, and machine learning and generative systems. Right. I mean, how cool. are those, yeah. is any of that different or the same thing or what? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So ACI is a research area would, uh, yeah, belongs to computer science, but also touches on psychology design. Uh, and, you know, you might meet HCI folks that have completely different um, um, focus there, emphasis there. I consider myself more on the technical end. Um, so if I talk to HCI people, I'm the machine learning guy. If I talk to machine learning people, I'm uh, the HCI guy. So kind of sitting in between these areas. So it's mostly applied machine learning or AI um, to um, either for HCI, so like improving user interfaces with some capabilities uh, provided by AI systems. But there's also the opposite direction that you can have an HCI perspective on AI systems, so kind of okay, how do I make this system interactively usable and useful, hopefully. So I'm interested in both of these uh, points of view. Yeah. That's helpful. Yeah, cool. Um, I've, I've read your article like three or four times, uh, <laughs> but I just started reading through and annotating again on now comment. And mm -hmm. On that now comment button there, there's a, a link to it, but it doesn't matter. I just uh, just so some okay. people know they can get to it and cool. um, some of the thinking around it. Um, do you want to maybe jump us in? Like, I got I got really interested in your article ma mainly because of the familiarity with reverse mm -hmm. outlining in our own field, right? Um, yeah. Of composition studies and so forth, and and then saying, oh, wow, that, that's cool what they're doing with AI. And you know, so do you want to kind of say how you got to that study and 
what it's sort of about? Right. So, I mean, so the 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 core idea is actually quite a few years old. So during my PhD, I had the, I had started to look into doing, which was on a slightly different topic. I should add, I started to look into more interactive uses of text generation models. So that was 2017, 2018. Um, and I had worked on text entry systems, so keyboards that adapt to the user, for instance, to reduce typing errors. And you know, maybe from your smartphone keyboards, you get these word, word suggestions. So there's a little bit of overlap, which requires some basic, now considered basic or ancient and super small language models um, for these word yeah. suggestions. So and there was some overlap and I, ex I tried to expand and think more about what else could we do in an interactive setting. And one of the ideas was, oh, maybe uh, I can annotate stuff that I write automatically. And mm -hmm. the simplest thing I had, I had a very early prototype of this was, okay, I, I found this model that could extract the most important or supposedly most important sentence. So what if I, you know, just highlight that in some sense automat automatically. And then th I didn't really pursue this further. Um, and then, yeah, I picked it up with, when I, so I got a, a grant to, to start a junior research group and had a bit more um, people involved and more capacity. And uh, yeah, I, we picked this up again and then um, okay. the paper is the result of, yeah, continuously thinking about that. Yeah, I will go back to that point um, in a second, yeah. but I, I, you did raise a couple of questions, th things that I have questions on already, which is what's what's the difference between the AI work and the sort of just completing or correcting the grammar um, kinds of systems? You right. seem to make a distinction in your article about that, but it wasn't absolutely clear to me. Um, that... Right. So I think there could be like two levels. So um, distinction on the technical level. So what mm -hmm. is the system and on the conceptual or interaction level? So I think for the interaction level, the, the main distinction, at least in our like HCI research bubble with this article is what, what is kind of the, the first part of the title beyond text generation. Um, so trying to think about ways of supporting people that write um, with with AI or with some technical um, system without writing for them, which is, yeah, I think the main things we've seen so far, like these word suggestions, and also, that's right, um, correcting grammar. Um, and that's also something we try to stay away from. So these annotations, uh, in being summaries and they are descriptive summaries. So they're not trying to assess or judge your text. They just try to reflect it back to you in some way. So that was a kind of design decision we had made. That was something we wanted to explore with this. So that was kind of set as a contribution because we thought this hasn't been explored before, at least in our uh, bubble of the literature. And then on a technical level, what I hinted at in, in my comment earlier was that um, <clears throat> so these these word suggestions systems, so that the way this is modeled, up, they are um, a lot simpler than what we have today. Like, um, so you would have so-called n-gram models, which are just models where you basically you take a, a lot of text, you count how often each word follows another word, uh, and then you know if you see word that word, you can predict what how likely it is that a, another word comes up. It's basically just a big table of word combinations. And then you can make that a little bit more sophisticated by thinking not just about two words, but also sequences of three words and so on. Um, and that's just, but still, it's just counting words and text. Um, and part of what the what the new, you know, without going to, to too much depth, but what the new uh, deep learning language models like ChatGPT and so on do is that they are they can actually model um, well longer context uh, um, for one, but also like as a human, if you if you do this task, I actually do this with students <laughs> in a lecture to give them some intuition. Um, if you give people uh, start of a sentence and ask them to complete it, and then in my examples in class, I make the 
the given context longer. And of course, that somehow narrows down what you can then um, add sensibly at the end. Uh, but as humans, we, we would maybe uh, be able to uh, abstract away from, from the concrete sequence of words because um, maybe I don't have a good example right now, but you can think of just replace some word with some synonym and what you, what, how you, the, the ways you could complete that sentence are maybe still roughly the same. And uh, yeah, this is one thing where the, the new uh, deep learning based language models, they, they can somehow do that um, as opposed to just having really taking literally all the, the sequences you've seen in, in a large text corpus um, where you wouldn't know about synonyms, for instance. I want to invite Andrea in any time you'd like, Andrea, but um, but not to put you on the spot. Oh, no, that's okay. I was, so my uh, PhD is in educational technology and educational psychology, and I looked at, in my dissertation, peer review comments. And so mm -hmm. I was just noticing some, like, overlapping methodology. I applied, like, social network analysis to their peer review, <clears throat> but... I also did the text analysis that some of the that you were naming around uh, the complexity of the sentences the students were doing mm -hmm. in their writing after peer review. And I just like, uh, I just think this is so interesting because of course I was looking at humans and they were using, hi, Marina. Um, I was using a, a program called Eli Review. So they were doing some blind reviews using the interface mm -hmm. to sort of guide them with templates very similarly to what Paul is doing uh, with the AI templates, but they were Eli Review structured it for the humans to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm kind of making all these connections. So I don't really have a point other than I'm over here churning away sure. um, because this is very similar to some of the research that I was doing and looking at particularly how self-efficacy changes when uh, the success comes. And I feel like that's a place that I'm curious about going forward in terms of like the technical work is one thing, but also the way that the efficacy can increase around writing. If you're feeling successful after interactions with AI, because it does lift some mm -hmm. of the cognitive load mm -hmm. around the writing um, to have that assistance. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's all the connections I made. <laughs> I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah. Um, Daniel, Marina, Marina's a, a co-journey person with us. Welcome, Marina. Teaches uh, second, third grade, third grade this year. Um, great. Um, so I, I don't mean to go too, go back to this too much, but I worry, or like the first way we began to describe what this AI stuff was to other people, to other teachers, was by using sort of like the way, the way you know, Gmail completes your sentences at the end. Mm -hmm. But I, but I worry that that's not really accurate. And so that's one. Like, is there? You're making a kind of distinction between those other ways that Andrew is just pointing to too, mm -hmm. and AI. I, th I think is that distinction important to make? Um, and and then within that question, do we really need like what is the value add to AI if we can already do it with those other processes? Right. So I think I didn't really mean to give that much weight to that distinction in this context. I was just uh, okay. saying that um, that was my my starting point with looking at an interactive use of language modeling, and at the time, the main at least. That they were also in my in the context of my PhD, which was on um, on mobile devices. Um, that was the main use case that existed, and I just wanted to point out that you know we've surpassed these models with the capabilities that the current models have. Fair enough. But they, I mean, they could still do these tasks, right? Predict the next word, but they can also do a lot more. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you want to pick up in a different direction or with what, like describe your study a little more perhaps? 
Is that fair? Is that fair? Yeah. yeah, or maybe the maybe the system as well. That's good. Um, yeah. yeah. Sure. So, can I share something? Like, yes, you can. Um, so you can share I screen. Did a few slides, but um, uh, where is it? It's on. It's called present at the bottom. Right. Maybe I can and just I hope do you can. I will. I will give you all access just in case. <laughs> oh, okay, so now I can choose. Uh, maybe I just do my second screen here. Yeah, that should work. Yeah, right. That's good. Ah, I can even see what I'm sharing. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a. Let me see what happens if I actually. Is that is it full screen now for you? We can make it bigger. Yep, it's good. We can see it. Well, well, yeah, okay. Well, I. Or yeah, what did you want to do? I've turned on presentation mode, but I'm not sure what sh what's showing up for you, because then it goes full screen for me. Uh, let me see if I can. We're okay in this mode. We can see it. Yeah, I think that's maybe it works like this. That's uh, <laughs> Okay, so I think now it's, it's full screen. Yeah, so that's a that's a figure, the main figure from the paper. We can see the prototype. So on the left hand side, we somehow try to replicate a typical basic text editor, and then um, we have these this additional sidebar with with cards. Um, there's one card for each paragraph. So these pop up automatically. I actually, have a video in a second if, if that plays. Let's see. Um, you can click on a card and it will navigate to that paragraph in the main text and highlight it in green so you can spot it easier. Um, then you have the summaries at the top. So the content in the card would replicate or duplicate the content in the text, except for unless you, you turned on the leftmost option, which is original, then it would be uh, the same text, but other than that, it will be summarized. So here we see the central sentence, so it picks out one sentence, which is like the, the thing I mentioned earlier. Um, but there's also a summary option, which um, uses a model to an AI model to write the summary of that um, paragraph. So it could change the text, basically. Um, and then there's a, also a keywords option, where it just picks out a few keywords, again, using some, some model for that. Um, you can drag and drop the card, so you can rearrange your draft by um, moving the cards. You can also move one card onto another one, which indicates that you want to merge these. This was a little more exploratory and experimental, and we all included like it will make a suggestion for merging it by, which is very simple, um, by just taking the five sentences, the most important sentences across both, and cutting the rest. Um, and I think that's it. You can delete a card to throw away the text. And yeah, I think that's, and you can copy the text in the card to the clipboard if you want to work with that further. Um, yeah, let's see if, yeah, the, if, the, video... See if the video works because the immediacy yeah. of this it w was, is an important part of it, I think. Yeah, so let's see if it Yeah, there you go. Up. It's working. So this is sped up. Um, yeah, you have the text editor and the sidebar. Um, it's, it's updated. So it's as we're updated. typing on the left side, it, it immediately appears on the right side. Right. At the moment, it's just the original, so it's uh -huh. duplicate, and then you can move to the central sentence or the summary um, and the keywords. <clears throat> Let's see, here's a longer draft. Yeah, that's the navigation part. <clears throat> and that's the merge. So it highlights in two colors the parts from each of the original ones and it cuts out the maybe less important ones. And then you can delete it. And I guess that's it. Let's see. The video I, I found very helpful <laughs> in, in establishing yeah. that idea. But but say well, well let me ask first. If you if you take a draft that you've done somewhere else and put it into this, yes, well, will it make all those summaries right away, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it will. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, people, I think some people did that. So maybe that's a good segue to the the study. So 
<coughs> methodologically, we usually do like these, these empirical studies. So we look at, um, let me go back maybe to, to the first one. <coughs> we build these prototype systems so that people can experience these ideas. Um, and then we test them with people. Um, this can be more quantitative um, or more qualitative, as in this case. Uh, we usually look at the interaction, so basically which key was pressed at which point, or how was the mouse moved, and so on. Um, so really detailed, um, but also yeah, talking to people, interviewing them, observing them, letting them think aloud while they're using it. Um, in this case, we gave them a, a writing task. They had to write an essay about a given text. And the idea was that it's a bit awkward if you give people a blank page and just write anything um, in this observed situation. So this was our attempt to give them something to start with um, that could be benefit also from some realization, of course, in itself. Um, and some people, um, not coming back to your comment, so some people started by copying in the given article completely into this editor ah. and then summarizing it. And so maybe as you noticed in the video um, for the summary that took a few millisec few hundred milliseconds, maybe the other ones are pretty much instantaneous. Um, when you copy it in, I think it took up to two seconds, but that was just a one-time thing. And of course it was limitation of our technical setup. Conceptually, you could speed it up um, if you put more resources into it. Um, so yeah, so some not to belabor stuff. it, but I just want to say this is more than you know a grammar checker could do, right? Just this kind of immediate summary and from for, you you need a an LLM, you need a large language model to do this, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes, for the for the for the writing the summary, for the central sentence you don't really need an LLM. LLM. You need so in this case, we used existing word vectors. Um, so that's basically you assign a number of, uh, yeah, a set of numbers to each word that represents the meaning of the word. And you, you need some way of training or modeling that, but you can do it once. And that's just a dictionary where one part is the English word, the other part is, is that, that set of numbers. Um, and then you have an algorithm that works on those numbers to find the, the central sentence which isn't uh, a large language model. It's just a computation on those numbers, basically. Um, th that's why it's also super fast. I mean, if, I don't think this is this really the, the kind of state of the art if you would want, you, because you, at the moment, I think you would pick, you would also use a large language model to extract a central sentence if that's your main thing that you want to optimize. But that was an earlier thing that, or uh, approach that was in literature and that was that is fast to compute so we use that but for the summary and also for the keywords we actually used the large language model but you could also do that in a little bit yeah simpler way cool i have a question good sure. was there anything that came up in like the interviews around the questionnaires of what the human response to this was that you couldn't include in your article but you think was interesting um, or you feel like all the good I, stuff's in there <laughs> well i wasn't the one doing the interviews um, oh, oh okay so, no worries um credits to my patients. responded to it yeah but uh i mean i've seen the transcripts and so on um and went through them for the analysis i don't think there was anything Thing that stood out in addition to it there were there were issues i think it's in the article a little bit about how skilled the writers are and how they could use the system right i think a little bit right so i think one observation yeah. was they're doing a think aloud right they they were thinking aloud with it a yes. little bit mm -hmm. so, that's, so that's kind of the methodology uh, that you ask people to think aloud while they use it. I think it, I mean, for anything with text, obviously it, there's a, um, yeah, it, it adds some cognitive burden if you ask to think aloud, but also you need to think about the text. It's easier with other tasks where maybe you have a more visual task, it's easier to verbalize that in parallel. Um, 
But I think because the task wasn't some, so just for context, so there are also like tasks we do that just, you know, kind of similar to reaction tasks, but just have a couple of seconds. But if you do like a writing task for half an hour or so, then it's fine if you have some, you know, quiet segments uh, where people are thinking about the, the task more than the tool. Um, so in this context, I think that that's okay. Um, yeah, with writing skills, I think there was some observation that um, maybe you would use it differently. I can't quite remember it. I could check in the article. Do you have it in mind again? What you wrote? Uh, not exactly. Um, okay. But that, yeah. I, I just, it's, it's the cognitive load stuff. The uh, one of the um, one of the points you guys make in the article that I've been quoting all over the place um, because it helped me understand the value of AI. Is, is this notion that um, when, when we ask students to do reverse outlining and we ask them to summarize their paragraphs, that's, mm -hmm. a, big, that's a big task, right? Writing all that summary. Right. And there are plenty of teachers who would say, yeah, but that's where all the thinking happens. Mm -hmm. and maybe, yeah. maybe. But then mm -hmm. you, you at least posit the possibility that getting a quick summary gets gives you another mm -hmm. view on the text and then you can get back to your creative flow faster. Um, right, so yeah, I think that was a critical point. So in the design, so when we, when we looked for some, you always want some kind, you don't want the design to um, start from nothing. You also, like, as I said, we usually start with building a prototype, but that's not really the starting point, right? You need to have some plans, some concept, what you want to, to explore what you want to study, what's the, the basic concept. And, he, and they usually like to have um, a somewhat theoretical foundation for this, some conceptual starting point that isn't, you know, just we had this idea. And HCI people, I think, would agree, and others would agree that usually we try to look beyond uh, the field or in other areas, in this case, the, the writing research area. And so the starting point with this reverse outline was like, okay, so if we, if we take that, if we, there's an obvious way of supporting this in yeah, with AI if you think about summaries. But then, you know, we, we might take the most important piece away from people by, by doing so. So we were, you know, skeptical and worried that, uh, that's why it's also, I think, quite prominent in the paper at the beginning of the concept that, yeah, there is this possibility that we take something away. And we made this argument or we thought about, okay, so what, what could be the benefit? And that is kind of making it easier to, to enter that phase of reflection um, if you have, if you don't need to start with the maybe more boring task of summary, summarizing it. Um, and then in the end, I think in the study, it also turned out that people valued this or perceived this somewhat, maybe more explicitly, somewhat implicitly as another view on their text. And then I think if that is something where you find value, then it's maybe a good thing that you were not the one summarizing your own text. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I'm gonna I, again. These are like these are becoming these have become my think partners in in some way in this work. Um, so thank you. Um, and I just want to emphasize them again. One is one is that you guys going out of your the computer science stuff, looking for cognitive processes that people are doing already, and mm -hmm. bringing that to the AI. That yeah. that that's very exciting because. As teachers, we have we have reams of um, I, I I like to call them knowledge frameworks, right? Yeah. That okay. that and 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 that's been my exploration in AI. Is that let's take a knowledge framework, let's take the habits of mind, for example, and let's see what AI can do with the habits of mind, or let's take this you know, yeah. this assessment these categories and see what AI can do. So that's a very exciting thing. And when I hear NPR and everybody else <laughs> interviewing teachers, I don't see them interviewing those of us who are doing that yet. So I want them to get there. Right? Um, so th that's a very important thing um, to mention. Andrea, you lean forward. Did you want to get in on that or, <laughs> or are you okay? I just love that because I think that's what makes this interesting to me is the initial reaction is this sort of repulsion of they're all cheating <laughs> and yeah. there's some nuance yeah. in the conversation yeah. about uh 
where those lines are. And okay, I don't know. Do you follow John? Paul, do you know? Oops, I, I lost you on it. Follow where? Paul, uh, John Spencer. No, I, I do. I oh, do, Andrea. <laughs> yeah. I will now. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna find all where. Oh, this one. Do I put it in here? Where is the chat? How do I find it's it? Down there, but you could also share a screen. All right. Well, yeah, I'll share my screen shows. since I can. Uh, there we go. Select a window or screen. Okay. Here we go. So he. I, I'm not sure if that's link. Yep, you're sharing it. Yeah. You're going in and out a little bit, Andrea, but go ahead. Yeah. Maybe maybe if you take off the, the camera for a second. Yeah. Okay. So he shared this me it's this from the textbook guy, like Mailer. Okay, whatever. I don't know how I feel. Uh -huh. I one was really interesting, and this is what I worked I went to last week, and you we were playing with a very similar idea, because, Paul, you were mentioning, like, is, is grammar check really doing the same thing? But what I do think is happening is that a lot of people are using Grammarly as a tool to assist their writers, and people are not necessarily freaking out about that. But I thought this was like, a great idea. And then all the way up to the fully created. And where we personally find a line and why, because I don't hear a lot of people articulating why the line is. Yeah, I'm not getting, I'm, 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 I'm having difficulty hearing all of that, Andrea. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> but we'll, it's okay. No, we'll, we'll get it. I, let me uh, maybe maybe it'll clear up and we can go back. Do you want to try yeah. to say it one more time or? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you you have an ice storm you're getting through. I think. Yeah, so, I think but so. we'll go back to the, so the the second point. Um, so that so using intellectual frameworks is one point. The second point that that is that you guys taught me um, is this notion of. Let's think about what we do manually, right? And see if mm -hmm. we can speed things up for students, but mm -hmm. but still have them be doing the thinking, right? So what what are the processes that AI could replace that, mm -hmm. right? Which which again, I think it's probably making some of the same points Andrew was kind of make, which is that we first say, oh no, they're gonna, you know, copy everything and turn in per, turn in mm -hmm. plagiarized text, but then to get teachers to get to the point of asking, what do I do in my class that could be sped up with AI? I think is a really good question to be asking. But so uh, we got a message from Andrea. Is that chat? <laughs> yeah. There, so you click on the people over there, and then you. Can oh see right. It. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. There's the link. She says, I think it was interesting to think about where is a line and how I do I know it's there. It feels intuitive. Right. It's not articulated. Cool, cool. Um, Marina, you have any quick thoughts about what's going on here? <laughs> I, she's always uh, looking at all the other stuff, but it's cool. Marina, you're, you're, um, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. Oh, wait, I always do that. Um, I always forget about that. Um, <laughs> I just so everybody else is like I I'm a I'm a listener and then I start diving so I start like list I listen and I start looking um but I um I, you know I also um have followed a bit of the um information that John Spencer has you know shared about the AI writing so I'd seen that chart that Andrea just shared um I can't remember who said it but it might have been I don't know if it was him or if it was like AJ Giuliani. I, so one of, one of them in that realm, those two, uh, they wrote a book together. But somebody said um, about, you know, with, with the rise of all of this is that, you know, 
you should ask your if you're if you're a teacher and there's a worries around this, start asking yourself questions like, have you been teaching writing or have you been assigning writing? And I think that that when I've talked to other educators, um, you know, I've kind of like brought that point up too. Um, it's really made me like reevaluate some of the tasks that I've asked students. And I'm much younger. You know, I am. I have younger students. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't have accessibility to anything, right? It just means that, um, especially since you're a Microsoft school. But go ahead. Yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've I've definitely noticed a lot more predictive text in the past couple of days popping up across <laughs> the platform. So um, there's that. But I'm I'm really like experimenting with it as a writer, but also as um, a teacher. I you know I really I think I Paul I shared with you that I I had created a mentor example for um, my you know a, a teacher I work with asked for like a mentor piece of a writing unit that we're working on, and I I didn't have it because it was the first unit, and she's a consultant teacher, and she kind of wanted to have something to work with. So I kind of played around with chat GBT. That was my first time really doing anything. And I was, you know, what came out, I was like fascinated by, um, because it really did sound like an eight year old, an eight year old. Hmm. Um, so I see a lot of potential in it to creating tools too, for, to, to help with the teaching practice. Daniel. Thank you, Marina. I, yeah. Um, Daniel, I want to get, I, I did have another question. Um, mm -hmm. You guys have set up a prototype of some sort. Um, not right. not that you have a business model in mind, but no. but but thinking in terms of um, how we could use this. Now, I I have taken your three things: the summary, the keywords, and or the that three things. I don't know if they're yours, yeah, yeah. right? And, and the and the central sentence and created. Um, created ways in WordPress for students to just take a paragraph, put it in, put it in this box and, and get, and get those things. Um, and so that's one sort of application of your work that I can imagine. Um, and I, this is a long question, but we, we've also in now comment, I mean, your interface and the now comment interface have like so many connections, which are interesting. <laughs> started to imagine what if we could in now comment have a student say give me a summary of that paragraph or mm -hmm. it fits your annotations work too probably mm -hmm. um and that pop up for the student um but what we st but sorry <laughs> here's the question how do you imagine this stuff is going to end up in products right like there's probably yeah. already there's probably already a Google Doc um, app that allows you to do this while you're writing in Google Docs. I can imagine Microsoft Word is going to sort of make it possible to do right there. Have right. you thought about that at all? Yeah. So I think there's a Google Doc document summary feature that I think for English can also automatically be generated. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of that. Um, so funnily enough, like uh, the first task I gave uh, my, my student um, when we looked or went back to this idea of, okay, maybe we can do something with summarization next to the text was to, what could we actually integrate it into a product, into um, Microsoft Word? Because they have this plugin architecture where you can basically do a little bit of web programming in, in, in Word, Xbox. actually. Uh -huh. In word, yeah, um, and he, the, the the issue we we got was like, okay, it is somewhat possible, but you're very limited in the interaction, and since that's like the main thing we are interested in looking at, we decided that this would be a, a useful prototype. But um, if you're just interested in listing a bunch of summaries, I think that could probably be done. Um, if you yeah hack, hack that together into this word plugin, I think in, in more generally I, I, I'm quite excited at the moment because I think with ChatGPT beyond this system itself, it opened up I think more interest um, for companies to put things like that into products. So previously I I sometimes cited two 
papers from Google um, on, so basically the, the paper for this um, sentence completion in Gmail and also um, the one for, I think it's called Smart Reply, where you have in the Gmail app, you get like free instant replies to an email that are just like two or three words long. So yes, that works for me or something like that. Um, and I always thought like in, in some other studies, for example, we looked at the value of having multiple parallel text suggestions instead of just one. Um, we thought like, okay, the companies are fairly conservative in the interface design for that. Um, so they're yeah. careful That's not to mess up the, the product experience with having too many suggestions. So for example, the one in Gmail is totally unpredictable in a way. Um, so sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. And that's because it's gated by utility. So there's a function that estimates how useful it would be for you. And that's basically just how, how sure the model is, that this is a good um, continuation. Um, and if it's not so sure, then it wouldn't show it at all. Um, and we did a study, for instance, where we had up to five sentence completions at every keystroke, which is excessive in comparison. And it slows you down um, because it takes a lot more time to read and make a decision. Uh, about these suggestions than just writing it yourself. But also we found that um, maybe efficiency isn't always the thing you're looking for. Um, so in that study, we, we did this, we tested this with native and non-native English speakers and for them, it was an English task. And for the non-native speakers, this has additional value. First of all, it's less of an overhead in terms of efficiency because you're just not as fast. And also it gives you insight into how, how could I phrase this? Um, so then for that, it's valuable to have more than one thing, even if you end, just end up using one of them or none of them at all. Um, and now with, with, with Microsoft investing into some of like these feature, open AI features and so on, I feel like they see that um, maybe they can try out, there's a little bit more to, to, to try out in some of the products. And it's, I think it's interesting to speculate if, if, I think on the one hand side, we will see some little features Add it here and there, but I mean, we could also think what what would Word look like if Word was developed from scratch today, right? And Hi, I, I think yeah. I think we'll try this out with some more specialized product that isn't they, they don't want to add a competitor with their existing products. So Microsoft wouldn't launch Word, but maybe they will launch a little to do app that has that just acts as a testbed for much more excessive AI features or something like that. Yeah. So that's my, my prediction. That really great thinking there, I think. <laughs> just, to, just to say, because we are at this, we like the window where teachers and researchers too can get in there and play with this stuff before mm. it gets baked into the big right. products is, is almost closing already, right? Um, yeah. But I don't know, we'll keep it open. But I just want to repeat back to you, see if I'm right. You're, you're suggesting yeah. there are two things that we can do with this that probably is not going to end up in the Microsoft or the Google product. And one is that we can get more suggestions and more variety of suggestions than they're probably going to allow us to get. And so that was my, my observation in, in the past. I think that that for me seemed like an indicator of them being conservative or careful with adding these. I don't yeah. think that we will, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I mean, I, I already see it in Bing, like you can ask it for a text, but uh, you can ask it to create something for you, but they give you four personalities. To right, them, right, right. Yeah, and so that, I was, yeah, yeah. I, I, I refer to, to these inline text suggestions where you, or text continuations. I think the, from an interaction design perspective, the the thing we see at the moment with ChatGPT is a different interaction style. It's more conversational. It's also in the name, right? And I think in that, in that style, it's different. Maybe we will see like here are three things instead of instead of just generating one, which is easy to do. It just maybe more taxing on the resources. Maybe that's why we're not doing it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But from interface perspective, yeah, that's an easy thing to do. But also at the same time, in that interaction style, you get more long, it's more like delegation. It's not like co-writing um, with, with some input. 
someone looking over your shoulder and suggesting things, but it's more like you delegate, you know, give me that. You just, you don't describe the start of your article, uh, don't write the start of your article, you describe what you want. That's different, also thinking, um, how you think about the writing. Right? And then you get more long-term pieces back. And for long-term pieces, I think it's, it takes a lot of time and investment to make a decision because ideally you would read everything first that you need to consider for making a decision. So I think that's also from an interaction point of view why you maybe don't want to show too many in parallel. Um, but a teacher yeah. might, and you might want to have the option to, you know, yeah. 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 The, um, <clears throat> and by the way, um, that reading and media literacy process of looking at AI, I've been like broadcasting that to teachers as much as I can. Like mm -hmm. this is a reading process. And if your kids are, yeah. you know, beginning readers, it's going to be part of the, you know, part of yeah. another part of the reading they're going to have to do. I just want the second point you were making and, and going back to the model, the prototype that you have in your study, you yeah. can do a lot of things with the summary. Like you can pull it into the text. Mm -hmm. You can combine paragraphs. You can delete stuff. Right? right, and you're saying that that's probably not going to end up in the in the Microsoft product, and that's the second point I think you were making. Like mm, what you no, can I, oh, okay, I, yeah. So I think I think this maybe would end up. So I, I I was really just thinking about the oh my past observation was about these text continuations that they were more careful. Okay, um, but with like providing additional information about your writing or text analysis in a way, I think this is easier to integrate or to you know justify as an extension of something they already have. Because if you think about something like um, a spell check or grammar check, uh, then it will add these wriggles, right? And, and so there are annotations already. So you just have a different type of annotation that they offer in addition. So I think this is easy to integrate. Yeah. But I think your study was about helping the writer understand the whole structure. Yeah, of their yeah, yeah. And not the not the little pieces. Necessarily. Yeah, so the little exactly. pieces yeah. in service of understanding the larger structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th I, I want to rush in and, and just to, before I forget it, just to say that um, some digital humanities folks, um, it, it felt adjacent to your work. Um, started mm -hmm. thinking about how AI could summarize each paragraph mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a piece of literature, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the, the idea, and I, I played with it, it's um, with the gift of the magic, right? So um, you, if you ask AI to say, okay, what's the summary of this paragraph? And then what's the mystery um, at the end of that? It mm -hmm. does a pretty good job of, of saying that and, and kind of, and if you do that, like every paragraph or every third paragraph, whatever, um, yeah. you start to get the structure of the text in an interesting way. So I think uh, using some of the summary stuff with literature is probably mm. worth pursuing, I think, as well. Yeah, I think the just from the top of my head, I think the main distinction that I would consider if you ask me now to you know, design a follow-up version for that use case is that it's not your own text. So right. you might have no initial mental model of what is in the text at which, you know, if you've written the text, if you've drafted it, and it's not like maybe a year ago, but even then you have some mental model, some idea of what, what is where, uh, and maybe what is missing, or you have specific questions. But if it's a text you've never read yourself, maybe, maybe you've, you, you've done that, right, for your literature analysis, but still, there could be a use case where you haven't done it. Um, then I think you have maybe different tasks you want to use the system for I don't know. maybe mm -hmm. it's like getting like you say getting an overview of the text then is different because you have you have no in, initial understanding of it and that should be reflected in the interface design cool so i have lots of other ideas but i want to hear more from you uh, like what what other what where else are you going what do you have in your students look at uh you know what's what's i mean has chat gpt right. exploded the world for you too or or were you there uh, already <laughs> yeah so in a way it is just bringing a lot more attention to what we are looking at 
um, there is a qualitative difference in, like I hinted at earlier, it's a slightly different interaction style that we can do or we could realize with this model that maybe wasn't, um, it was possible before and we tried the conversational interfaces as well. Um, but it was more limited in the capabilities of the AI. So that, that is different. So that changes potentially something else. Some other observation, like in the first weeks of that, um, I made just online, like on Twitter and so on, is that many people that maybe didn't really look at the human computer interaction side, coming at it more from the, the interest was more on the AI side, they started to actually uh, think about interaction problems more without maybe noticing it. So that was super interesting. Um, so people sharing their little demo they, they put together that in the back end used um, chat GPT or you know, experiments they did or GPT-3 as precursor and so on. And they, but they presented some interface ideas without really previously maybe having any interest in that. So I think that, that's, that's super interesting and exciting to see more people realizing that that is an interesting part of AI as well. Is that connected to sort of prompt engineering or not? Is that what you mean by interface or do you mean the... Oh, right. Okay. So yeah, that maybe is one flavor of it. Um, uh -huh. So okay. the interface of, I need to input text, but also just, you know, I uh, maybe just from the top of my head. So there was someone who built like a post-it board where you uh -huh. add a, a thought on a post-it and it would generate an image for that or it would generate another post-it next to it, continuing this text and stuff like that. So little, little interface ideas. Um, um, that yeah, I can imagine a whole creative. people were inspired to to just try out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I'm I'm your work early work with your dissertation or something was about annotation. Did I hear that correctly, or shortly after that? No, the dissertation was about um, adapting user interfaces to individual users on mobile devices. So slightly different, but the overlap was that one thing you can adapt is the keyboard. Um, so the way you hold the phone um, is different from the way I hold my phone, with different hand sizes, and we've learned to type differently and so on. And huh. you can make little adjustments in the background to reduce, um, for instance, um, typing errors. Cool. So let me, I, I was, got like seven minutes left if you're still with us, so you good? Sure. No? Okay, good. I, I just, um, so, one of the one of the thoughts on 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 now comment and now comment is a place where you can put like the gift of the magi up right um and um one of the things we've been exploring is what if we could have ai respond to the text right mm -hmm. so that yes right now what happens is you know my 20 students go in and they comment on different paragraphs and then they, they comment on each other's right. but what if we could say create a sort of a mock um, profile mm -hmm. as a, a Marxist responder, right? And so the students could then click, I want to see what a Marxist would say about this paragraph. Um, and they would get the text right. back, right? So yeah. is that of interest, do you think? Or do you, some, some people say, why would you want to do that? That's going to create so much, you know, so much noise in the system. But I'm curious about it. <laughs> right. So let's see. Uh, so I think I was just looking at, uh, I can show this in the chat. This is um, a paper that came to mind. Um, it's called, I think we also cited in the, in the other paper, called Conversations of Documents, um, which has this idea that you basically have a conversational interface, like a chatbot, or could also be a voice assistant that you can ask questions about the content of a document, uh -huh. um, which seems related. Um, it does, yeah. But then you want to, if I understood it correctly, you wanted to also put like a background or personality maybe to that commenter, to that AI commenter, right? Yeah, there's um, uh, yeah, Deborah Appleman yeah. in our world, um, <laughs> right, um, has yeah. has these has taken literary theories, right? A feminist literary theory, a, a Marxist literary theory, a, whatever, a reader response literary theory, and and I suggest that that's a way to look at literature, right? So I'm thinking that if you could have, I don't know if to call them bots or not, but yeah, you could have like a feminist bot 
respond to the text you're reading right and then see right. what see what the ai gives you what i'm excited about is not necessarily what you get but that then you could respond to that right you could mm, you could right. reply to that person but right so i mean if i it's sometimes useful to think about um how the systems are trained and what what the output then what we can think of the that the output represents instead of just taking it literally as there's an opinion about something in there so in this case, I would like to frame it as um, information retrieval, maybe more like uh, as, as writing. So I could, you know, I'm interested in the view of a particular perspective or group of people on, on a text. So I could do some research on that group of people and, uh, and so on. And maybe the language, the language model gives me in this case is a shortcut to that. So I get to, I get, I get maybe an average, uh, more typical response or the expectation of the model after having read the internet, so to say, mm -hmm. um, on that document from that perspective. But I think, I, I think it's in this use case, I would be, um, I think it, it would have, to, we would have to be careful that to realize that that is maybe an, more like an, an average response. So it wouldn't have to, match with any particular expert or person of that group representative of a group that you, you ask um, that's helpful because some people have suggested why don't we just have sylvia plath respond to her, right and, right. and that's you're suggesting that's probably a mistake and going with the the lens idea might be better like the perspective so, yeah you might still have the name of a person in the prompt uh -huh. because that kind of is like um maybe elicit right nudging the model in the right direction that's a shortcut to describing the perspective of that group because you know that person's name on the training data that it pulled from the internet is associated with that perspective but i think i wouldn't see it as literally um being that perspective from that person necessarily i get that what i'm hoping in this is that there's a a place to describe the the bot like there's a, a bio mm. box and so yeah, people yeah. could experiment with oh if i describe it with this mm. instead or with that instead what kind of response right. it could be. all right i want to end by asking i'm thanking you for being a researcher who's come on to talk to teachers <laughs> but, then, but, me, yeah. but then but then to ask you like you're a teacher too right do you you're right you have yeah. students yeah i'm just saying but, but then they ask you, like, I think when, when you know, the culture gets blown up like this around, mm. around these issues, there is an opportunity for more dialogue. Can you suggest Same. how teachers could approach researchers, how, how we can continue this dialogue in some way? All right. Um, hmm. So <laughs> maybe from... <laughs> Tricky. So, from my from my perspective, I think yeah. um, this this the paper we talked about, like mm -hmm. um, with the summaries, um, and maybe the one before that I mentioned with the text suggestions and native and non-native speakers. For me, in the like doing the literature research for that for those projects, uh, for me it was like uh, maybe maybe not the very first, but maybe the first time to really more deeply look into this writing research and then i realized you know i'm not sure if that's even the name you, you would use but um sure that's fine yeah, yeah okay but but and i, I realized okay there's there are many articles like um with with uh with instruction writing instruction for example in mind and studies with teachers and students and so on and uh, this actually would connect to one of the comments made earlier by the others that um there's i think there's even some methodological overlap, like, okay, you record what was written at which point, and I found like this, this similar, which we, which we do kind of always, but uh, I also found like this in some of the, this, this other work that uh, from writing research that people would look at pauses and bursts and stuff like that. And I felt like, okay, that's super similar to an HCI logging study or method. Um, so I think that there is more, they, yeah, I guess both, both fields could benefit from more talking more with each other. And I think this is also true for other areas. I also want to 
maybe bridge, build more bridges between HCI and natural language processing or the AI communities behind that. I'm starting to see some efforts like that with workshops at conferences that represent the other side, so to say. Um, so maybe that is that is something, I don't know. If, if, so in my field, yeah, conferences are a main point of exchange. So if you, if there's, you know, a workshop that could be organized um, at an HCI conference with teachers or at a conference from your area with HCI folks, then I think that that might get yeah, a discussion great. started. It's a really interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool, cool. I, I just want just my last shot on, on your the, that study you mentioned um, that we've been talking about here is is that I love how iterative you were between the first work and mm. the second work and yeah. how you changed the model in between. And you can yeah. kind of imagine how it might change for the third time. And so, yeah. It's, that, certainly, yeah. So it's, so important. I mean, it's a usual way we work, like, and also teach user-centered design where you talk to pe the people that will be affected by whatever you're building and try to elicit what what they want from such technology uh, i mean in this case we started with a concept and then iterated on it it's not always surfaced that much in a paper which is like in terms of publication strategy can be risky because you spend a lot of time on something that ultimately didn't make the cut right um, but in this case i think because it was interesting to what we learned from the from the first version as well put it yeah. in in quite a bit of detail yeah yeah, yeah. I appreciated that that history there. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, it's you, getting late in the evening here for you. So, <laughs> That's fine. Just, so good to talk to you. We'll yeah. keep keep uh, connecting, I hope. Yeah. Thank you very Certainly. much. Would be great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye.